And it looks like we are live. Hello, everybody. Give me just a minute here. As you always know, we got to get our Facebook groups in here to join in a wonderful discussion here on a Friday evening for Dove Valley Deep Divers. Waiting on some check marks. Looks like we're good to go. Mile high. Hello, everybody in Broncos country. Welcome into another episode of the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. I am your host, Lance Sanderson, and joining me as per usual is my good friend and colleague. He is Mile High Huddle's senior NFL draft analyst, the one and only Eric Trickle. And tonight, guys, we have a treat for you because Eric just released his top 100 big board going into the combine. We're going to talk a lot about draft prospects, but first, dude, Eric, first things first, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing good. I mean, it's been a long week of getting, you know, not only did I get my top 100 players out, I got my top five at each position, got those yep. out getting everything ready for the combine. I've got a couple articles in the works for that for over the weekend that are going to be talking about a few players that can have a, that have kind of a big question around them that can, you can actually get an answer to at the combine, mm-hmm. whether it be, you know, getting concrete testing numbers for certain areas, you know, getting answers to some medical questions, you know, the interviews for some character stuff, even measurements, like all of this stuff, it goes into the evaluation for it. Uh, so I'm going to be getting a couple articles of that over the next couple days out there and then switching gears um, to focus on, you know, the combine stuff and then getting out scouting reports. I mean, I've touched mm-hmm. on a couple things, but the Finding Broncos scouting reports have been a staple at Mile High Huddle for almost 10, every all 10 years now, I think. Damn um, yeah, yeah. Mile High Huddle has been around. Um we're changing up the way we do those a little bit this year to make it a little bit more fresh and interesting. Um, but we're going to be switch, switching focus into that a little bit. I'm excited for that. For agencies not far around the corner, like the height of the off season is just is basically here at our fingertips, and I'm excited. Yeah, likewise as well, man. And like you said, you know, Finding Broncos has been going on for damn near 10 years at least. I've been honored to be a part of this for at least the last three years and and looking forward to getting into uh, some deeper prospects. I I usually do a lot of stuff in the top 150, but this year uh, you've tasked me with doing a lot of stuff outside of the top 100 so i'm i'm very very much intrigued by that very excited to get into the, all of that as well david mcarath jumping in here right before the show got started here with a two dollar super chat good evening broncos country we also have another one here from our good friend david cromolo saying with the ten dollar super chat good evening eric and lance two questions one do you anticipate the broncos eating the 53 million dollars of the 85 million dollar dead cap hit for russell wilson this year or and two is it almost safe to rule out a quarterback for the broncos in round one this actually ties into what just happened a few hours ago earlier today the the nfl released the new salary cap number for uh, this season the nfl salary cap is set this year at 255.4 million dollars a 30 point Point six million dollar record increase year over year, nearly doubling what uh, the 2022 to 2023 uh, salary cap hike was uh, a couple of years ago. This is a big news for the Denver Broncos, and it ties right in here. Do you anticipate the Broncos eating the 53 million dollars of the 85 million dollar dead cap this year for Russell Wilson? Eric, what do you think on the big news of the day in the NFL? Well, a couple things first. There's a bunch of misconceptions about it. This isn't saying the Broncos have $30 million in cap space. It's just it was about the what the salary cap is set at is about $13 million more than the projection, and the Broncos mm-hmm. were projected to have about $25 million over the salary cap. So instead of that, they're only sitting about 12 or $13 million over the salary cap. They are still in the red. They still have to get out from underneath that before they can sign anybody um, and get that going. And so it's it's still a lot of work, but they are in a slightly better position than they were, you know, yesterday when we still thought they were going to be about twenty four million over the cap, um, twenty five million. Mm-hmm. Also on top of this is there are still performance escalators that are going to come. People are going to get a lot of raises. Patrick Sertan, he's going to be one of those guys getting a raise. And on that note, we also figured out exactly what his fifth year option salary cap number is going to be, mm-hmm. and we have until May second to see that picked up. It'll be picked up. Um, whether with the Broncos or another team, if he happens, you know, to be used in a trade to move up for one of these quarterbacks. So 
the Broncos are still in a not so great position, but it's not as dire as it was. Right. And either way, they're moving on from Russell Wilson this year. I saw somebody post that Tom Pelissero made a comment about them keeping him. I was searching for that comment. I haven't seen anything um, from Tom Pelissero saying that they the Broncos would keep him. Last thing I saw was a, like the day before the Super Bowl, he tweeted out that, well, they may not necessarily move on. And then Russell Wilson and his wife started showing off their house. They're listing their house. Mm-hmm. They're getting ready to move because he's on his way out. He will not be with the Broncos this year. Um, so yeah, I mean, however they do that, whether they eat it all this year, which I doubt or split it up over the two years with the, um, with the post June 1st designation, which doesn't help their salary cap situation immediately because you don't get the benefits from that until after June 1st, Russell Mm -hmm. Wilson will be able to be free to go sign elsewhere, but you don't get the cap benefits until after June 1st with the June 1st, um, thing today with that. Um, William Canalano, who's the one who said about that, what he said on Rich Eisen's show today. I must have missed that part because I listened to it. I didn't catch it. And I guess so did everybody else because that is some, the kind of news that would have been all over Broncos Twitter today. Yeah. Um, and so I must have missed it and everybody must have missed it. Um, or so, something. There's some sort of disconnect there. Now, yeah. going back to David's question, because there's another part here. Is it almost safe to rule out a quarterback for the Broncos in round one? No. It's no. still very much an option. They could yep. still move up. They could still fall in love with somebody at 12. They can still move down and take one. Every All the options are still on the table. Um, yeah, there, there, it's not safe to rule it out whatsoever. But it, well, it's not safe to for for the Broncos to bring in potentially a guy like Sam Darnold. I mean, James Winston is still out there. They, they could draft a, a player in the later rounds. And in fact, we got Broncos 007 jumping in here before we get into the top 100. This is actually kind of a spoiler alert here for you uh, saying, hey, guys, been waiting for you all to live stream to ask how you both feel about Jordan Travis. Do you think his potential could be worth drafting him late and then letting him sit after his injury? Now, Eric, um, Spoiler alert, Jordan Travis did not make your top 100, but I like him. I, I think that there is something to develop here. The The broken leg late in the season, it, unfortunately for Florida State, kicked him out of the, the college football playoff. Uh, there's, there's a lot to like with Jordan Travis. He plays with a little bit of anticipation. He trusts his receivers. That's definitely sure on tape. But what are your thoughts over uh, uh, overall on Jordan Travis and his potential draft stock this year before we get into your top 100? Well, I mean – he has a chance to get injured. He was having a pretty good season or get drafted. He was having a pretty good season before he got hurt. And obviously that injury muck, uh, muddies things up a little bit. But for me, he was never a top 100 player. Even when he was healthy and even taking out the injury, he was still not a top 100 player for me. He's a guy that at the time, maybe on flyer and with injury, I'm now thinking sixth or seventh round flyer, flyer. Unless you feel confident, you can try to pull him as an undrafted free agent. Because when you get around, typically what teams are doing at that point is who are these priority undrafted free agents that you want that you don't think you have would have a legit shot of getting that you think mm-hmm. that they'll end elsewhere for whatever reason. Because another thing that NFL teams do during part of this evaluation is they know how to talk to agents and stuff like that. They know what, what players are looking for, especially these guys that are, you know, may not get drafted and okay, if they don't get drafted, are they going to want to stay somewhere closer to home? Are they wanting a little bit less competition to try to make the, the roster a little easier? They get that kind of information, and they use that to make some of these drafting decisions in the seventh round, sometimes mm-hmm. even in the eighth round. So Jordan Travis, he's one of those guys, maybe a sixth, round, sixth or seventh round flyer, maybe undrafted, depending on how things feel. Um, and just seeing what he can do. Um, I mean, it's I'm a firm believer that you draft a quarterback every single year, even if it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be first round. Um, yeah, he could be that quarterback you take a shot on this year. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that one. And quite honestly, if if the Broncos do want to keep Russell Wilson around, which I, I'm I'm with you, I think that he's gone. I've I've mentioned that written times, uh, written multiple times about it uh, on article form. I've said it multiple times here on DVDD. Uh, Russell Wilson's probably not going to be around. But if you do keep him around, Jordan Travis might be a guy that. Similar enough skill sets, they can work well together and help a guy learn and grow and see if he can tap into that. The high potential. I think there is potential here for Jordan Travis that he could potentially be a 
low tier starter, but at least a guy that you might be able to throw out there um, if he develops long enough and it just kind of refines that skill set. Uh, last one here, we got Michael Ronquillo jumping in here, the Ronk over on Facebook, throwing his stars down like he always is want to do. Good evening, Lance and Eric on the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. Go Broncos. Go Michael. Thank you, dude. We appreciate you for your never ending support here at the Mile High Huddle Podcast Network. Now with that, Eric, let's get into this. You mentioned just a little bit ago before we get started into the top 100. You talked oh, about the combine. Oh, we got a follow up question from David's here. I, I, I missed this. I, I do apologize. No Scott right now. He should be here just a little bit. Um, if, if hopefully he is able to join in with us. But anyways, David jumps in here another five dollar super chat saying follow up question. Uh, do you think the Broncos split the 85 million dead cap? Uh, or uh, let's see here. A fifty-three million dollars in twenty twenty-four, thirty-two million in twenty-five, or B thirty-nine million in twenty-four, forty-six million in twenty-five. Saying, do you think that the Broncos eat the entire dead cap hit for this uh, Russell Wilson contract uh, this season, or that they split it over the next two years with that post June first designation on the Russell Wilson contract? No, he's asking how they're going to split it. Okay, um, with a post June first designation, with the way his contract is structured, there are a few different out avenues to splitting that up um and they can basic they can basically have some say in which way they go with it um as well as just the way that post and prison designation is i'm not fully sure on all the rules with it with between the structure and all that stuff like that um but with them being over the salary cap already i have a hard time with seeing them go the 53 million this year and then the lesser hit next year next year they're a little bit in a better spot so mm -hmm maybe seeing that you know the bigger uh hit for that dead money next year instead of this year and basically saying we're gonna we're, we're gonna take a huge hit on dead cap over the next two years just to get out from under out, out from underneath this contract of his yeah that makes sense I, I, and sorry for misunderstanding the the question there i i, I get it now that you voicing it out and me trying to read it in my head were two completely different sides of the conversation but thank you david i hope that mm -hmm. answers your question uh Real quick, I did finally find the clip of Tom Pelissaro on it and everything. He doesn't say that Russell Wilson will be back, uh, William. I know that you're doing that. He says that it's still a possibility, which was always, you know, that was mm. always a thing. It's still possible. Um, he mentions that they're going to, you know, um, his agent, the Broncos, they're going to get a good idea of the salary cap uh, or the contract stuff next week at the combine, you know, through all this illegal tampering that happens at mm -hmm. the combine. You start talking contracts with agents and stuff. They'll get a good idea on that, where the Broncos stand, where the Broncos stand, where his agent stands, and then they'll go from there. He's not saying mm -hmm. that he will be back. He's saying it's a possibility. It is a very long, very, very, very long shot that Russell Wilson is back with the Broncos this year, though. Yeah, it's it's a non-zero oh, no. chance, but I, I do believe it's uh I do believe it's a, at least less than five percent chance. Let's put it that way. Paul, my dude, this guy comes in here all the time talking trash on all of the Iowa players. Boo Iowa super. Enjoy this pod, Lance and Eric. <laughs> yes. And yes, no, it's not. It is not ignorant to say say that he's gone though. Um, and it's not, and he's not saying it's more like, don't be surprised. He's saying there's a chance. And if you listen to what he's saying, he's making it very clear. It is a very small chance mm -hmm. that Russell Wilson is back with the Broncos this year and that he is most likely gone. Just was listening to the clip. Um, yeah. And it's with every other report that's out there about it. The expectation is maybe a less than 1% chance that Wilson's back and a greater than 99% chance that he's gone. That's yeah. the way it is. There, I mean, if there was a good chance that he was coming, that Wilson would be back, he wouldn't be trying to sell his place. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. He's probably going to be a Pittsburgh Steeler, by the way. That's the that's my Steelers, Falcons, Raiders. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of options here. All right. Wow, that took a lot longer than I wanted it to. We got a lot to cover for you guys. This is going to be a rapid fire show, so buckle up, guys. This is going to be a lot of fun. We have. Eric Trickle's top 100 players as Geo comes in 0 .00, a million zeros five percent. Regardless, Eric, you mentioned something at the top of the show. This is just a quick opening question for you: um, the combine and how this could potentially alter the the big boards, draft stocks, and stuff like that. 
your top 100 is never set in stone. I know you well enough to know that. You're going to change some opinions and move your thoughts around, get a little bit more information, and this board is never going to be uh, never going to be firmly set until about a week, maybe 10 days before the draft is actually ready to start. How much does the combine affect your grades as of right now? So every there's always questions about the combine. Uh, or about players that you can get answers at the combine. We talked about that measurements, you know, certain athletic testing, um, certain character stuff. Uh, there's a lot of leaking that comes out at the combine uh, about this stuff. And with some of these players, they have serious questions there that help lead them to where a um, to to lead them to or find them landing where they're at. And yeah, there's all there's movement for it. I'm typically don't have like huge movers guys don't typically move or fall by more than a handful of spots outside of certain extreme cases. Some guy goes out there and I'm expecting to see a really good athlete on tape and he just completely bombs athletic testing. I'm going to go back and watch. I'm going to try to uh, figure out what the difference may be. Maybe he's listed at say 180 pounds and he's weighing 210 at the combine. Maybe that is something there. Um, maybe that's why he didn't test that well. Try to find answers to it, and then you can take a hit. Um, or a guy who just goes and completely just test out of their mind, far beyond expectations. They'll don't move, don't move up quite a bit for it because you can always work around the athleticism. You can always teach everything. You can't teach athleticism. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few guys that we're probably going to be talking about. I'm, I think you have a couple questions set up for me, uh, set up for uh, to, to mention about a couple of those guys in spe uh, specifically but one guy that comes to mind is a corner out of alabama and kool-aid mckinstry mm -hmm. who there's a serious questions about his long speed and there's a corner out of georgia too that has a lot of questions about his his mm -hmm. quickness fluidity and, and speed overall both those guys when we see their 40 depending on where they fall they can fall down my board a little bit mm -hmm. uh, now there are certain elements to it that i only factor in a little bit medical stuff is a slight factor at this point um, until I get more concrete answers out of the combine, things like that. So there's all, there's always movement with the combine and they'll continue moving up until, you know, just a few days prior to the, to the, to the draft because of, you know, there's potential for legal issues to pop up um, mm -hmm. flag that we didn't know was there ends up coming out for off the field pro day stuff, injuries, um, things like that like jl skinner tore his uh tore his peck just the day before the combine last year um yeah. that dropped him down quite a bit on my board because it was essentially most likely leading to a red shirt year but mm -hmm. he just was able to come back so quickly from that um although he only played one defensive snap for the broncos we also have some stars coming in from steven thank you steven we appreciate that he asks bro chiefs raiders chargers Bengals are going to try to beat us in the draft um one thing I have learned from doing this is you don't want to win the draft necessarily um, because when you win the draft, like, you know, when the grades come out and those teams with an A two, three years later, those A's are mo looking more like F's. Not yeah. always the case. I mean, the Houston Texans were praised for their draft class last year and it's worked out extremely well for them, mm -hmm. but more often than not, you know, those early winners of the draft class are the guys that, are the teams that end up regretting it a couple years later? Yeah, well, and then you get then you get uh, teams like the uh, 2017 draft for the New Orleans Saints, where everyone's like, "What the hell are these guys doing?" Like Alvin Kamara was not supposed to be drafted that high. Trey Hendrickson, what are you, like what is and come to find out, Alvin Kamara is one of the best running backs in the NFL. Trey Hendrickson goes on to be uh, Marshawn Lattimore. Like that draft class for the Saints was widely criticized for what they were actually doing because they passed on um, Deshaun Watson to take Marshawn Lattimore and. That whole situation played itself out. It, the draft's a crapshoot, and it, it always will be. But we can still talk about it and still have a lot of fun doing so. Um, let's get into your top 100 here, Eric, because, uh, guys, follow along with us if you have the opportunity to. Go to milehighhuddle.com. Find Eric's top 100 uh big board here follow along with the conversation we're not going to read the entire thing for you we're just going to highlight a whole bunch of players and just have some fun with this conversation and as you guys look through it you guys may end up having questions of your own yep. um that lance doesn't ask me and you guys can get those in the chat and we'll definitely address them as long as we're able to um, yep. we are down to the final 40 minutes of the show already give or take um so get your questions in and real quick another good question here 
Dennis Woods kind of on topic about the combine affecting it. If a player from Dennis Woods, hey Lance and Eric, if a player doesn't participate in the combine, how much does that affect his draft stock? Fully depends. Um, very rarely will it be a huge hit if they're perfectly able, they're not injured, and they decide not to participate. It's not really a hit. Um, in fact, if they're hurt, I would rather them not participate. That happened, I think it was two years ago. There was a player who uh, hurt his hamstring doing a 40 run. Mm -hmm. And he ran into the 40 again, made it worse, did all the drills, and kept making it worse, and ended up missing a good portion of the season. And only was drafted, at, like I think he may have went undrafted or drafted in like the seventh round. Yeah. Um, so injuries aren't something to mess with. Um, you can also have uh, oh, who, Ruben Foster was he or uh, who was that Alabama linebacker that attacked the medical staff at the combine? Oh, uh, dang yeah, it, 2017, um, 2017. A lot of people wanted him. Yeah. Was it Ruben Foster? No, it was the uh, Christian Harris. No, no, it wasn't. I swear it was Christian Harris. No, I know for a fact that it wasn't. It was twenty. It was a twenty seventeen NFL draft because a lot of people wanted to draft him over the Broncos. It was Ruben Foster because he was ended up okay. going to the 49ers. Um, so Ruben Foster had a lot of issues, and during at the combine, he attacked the medical staff, um, which obviously that leaked and everything. And uh, a couple of our fellow MHH guys got mad at me because I use that a lot. Um, <laughs> as to why I didn't like the against the guy, but off track getting back on track if they don't participate it doesn't really affect it if there's a good reason if there's not a good reason it might be a slight hit to it mm -hmm. um and then of course there's guys that aren't invited they don't get a hit because they're not invited um it it obviously stinks with some of these guys this year more so than last year there were fewer you know combine snubs i think like true snubs last year there were three players drafted in the third round who weren't invited to the combine mm -hmm. one of them Kobe had turner. the best season for an interior defensive lineman this year um yeah. and kobe turner um marte mapu and um oh dang it i can't remember his name now he ended up going to the lions in the third round also wasn't invited to it big defensive oh, lineman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um yep. western kentucky D. broderick martin um He's another guy who wasn't invited. I still liked all three of them a lot, and it didn't hurt their grades. Uh, so it all it all just depends, Dennis. Like in all honesty, and sorry for the long winded answer there. <laughs> um, it, it's all it, it's all good. First off, it's a great question, and it, it's very relevant to what we have going on here. But uh, again, guys, milehighhuddle.com. Go and check out Eric's um, his top one hundred big board at least as of right now going into the combine uh eric let's let's get to, get into this man drake may drake may quarterback two on your quarterback rankings seemingly falling down draft boards the last few weeks uh you have a num uh, number four on your big board is he a player that worked well with sean payton and is the the rumors of him falling down draft boards kind of overblown a little bit so my question with this, and I kind of talked to it with a, a good friend of ours, JR Drafts um, on Twitter, yep. um, does a lot of great content. Make sure you guys are checking him out on Twitter. Um, to me, I saw some dude saying that uh, he's Malik Willis this year, that he, no. he's getting all this top 10 buzz and going to go in the third round. No. Uh, if Drake May falls a little bit, he'll fall to quarterback three and still a top 10 pick. Mm -hmm. um i'm not buying the fall i think prospect fatigue with these quarterbacks um with caleb williams and drake may especially are setting in because there's been a lot of comments about uh caleb williams not being a top 10 pick um or worth a top 10 pick prospect fatigue it's a real thing um mm -hmm. even i i deal with that uh i won't i won't lie um you end up watching a player a little bit too much and you just get tired of it and you just start nitpicking a little bit more um, but as for can he work with him? Oh yeah. I don't think there's a quarterback in this class that's a better fit for what Sean Payton does on offense than Drake May. The middle mm -hmm. of the field stuff checks the box. Intelligent quick processor checks that box. Can make all the timing. throws you need to push the ball, timing, rhythm. He can do it all. He can be create he can create on his own. Doesn't mean that he's a perfect prospect by any means. You just have to go and clean up a lot of this stuff, but he has the ability to do whatever Sean Payton will ask of him. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Timing, anticipation, touch, the whole nine yards. Drake May is – he's fantastic. I just want to 
open up the the conversation a little bit here. And there's a, pot- a potential possibility the Broncos could trade up and go get a guy like Drake May. Uh, Quentin Caldwell jumping in here with the five dollar super chat. First things first, welcome to the show. Uh, first time that I remember seeing your name. And if you've been in here before, I do apologize for not remembering you. But thank you for joining in. Good evening, everyone. Quentin says, and good evening to you, Quentin. Thank you for joining us this wonderful Friday evening. Um, the you, you have a player here in Brock Bowers, tight end out of Georgia, number five on your big board right now. And to me, that's that's ridiculously high for a tight end. I mean, positional value matters here. It, it absolutely does. We've seen it before, though, with Kyle Pitts a few years ago. And, Eric, I, I guess with, with Pitts going, what, number four overall to the Atlanta Falcons a couple of years ago, if you had to con- like compare the two grade-wise, how does Bowers stand in comparison to what they put onto the field as prospects? Bowers is significantly better. Kyle Pitts was a big receiver. Mm-hmm. Bowers, I mean, his big blocking's slot. not great. He's not. He's not a blocker, but he he can offer up enough there. Just as versatile, can do so much for it. But the biggest thing for me in his career, Brock Bowers has almost fifteen hundred yards after the catch. Mm-hmm. Almost over fifteen hundred yards. There's never been a first round tight end who's had more than a thousand in their college career. He has the second highest yards per yards after the catch per reception in the NFL and is the as one of two over eight. David Njoku is the other one who's mm-hmm. become a phenomenal love tight end. Dude. Yeah, love that dude. excellent receiving weapon. I think it is a disservice to Brock Bowers to label him as a tight end because mm-hmm. he's not. He is an offensive weapon that you can line up anywhere and create mismatches um, Super for, for the offense. So, yeah, I mean, if Kyle Pitts was the fourth overall pick, Brock Bowers, 100% deserving of it. And this the class this year isn't like the class Kyle Pitts was in at the top. Mm-hmm. Um, Kyle Pitts, to me, was overdrafted, even though I liked him. Um, uh, liked him a decent amount. Brock Bowers is a such a better prospect. But yes, he does play a slightly lesser value position, which is going to cause him. He's not going to be a top five pick unless the charges really surprise a lot of people. Um, but he's he's probably going to, he's going to be a top fifteen pick at the very least, yeah. which just speaks to how talented of a prospect he is. How much? Well, potential I, he is. I wrote in an article uh, talking about your um, the mock draft you did last week, saying you know like a, a guy like Olu Fashanu, who we'll get in here in just a second. Um, Olu Fashanu, left tackle, Penn State, and Brock Bowers uh, would be like the two players that I would be the most excited about if the Broncos drafted them at number twelve overall. Quite honestly, because Fashanu, first off. He's a dancing bear left tackle. And if you're moving on from Garrett Bowles, I'm all about Fashanu. He's proven himself over the last couple of seasons um, at, at Penn State in terms of being a quality pass protector. Powers is a little bit of an issue there. But still, this dude is a legitimate starting day one left tackle in the league. And then Brock Bowers, man. You need the tight end. You need to have that mismatch. You need to get into, I don't want to call it the, the Travis Kelsey, George Kittle line, but Brock Bowers compares favorably to George Kittle. So those two players would be at 12 overall, the, the two players I'd probably be the most excited about in terms of the Broncos drafting and not using that 12th overall pick as a trade piece to either move up or down in this draft. Last thing here in your top 10, um, one of the first things that stood out was having uh, Jackson Powers John, uh, Johnson over Olu Fashanu, uh, the center out of Oregon, powerful, just an a overall complete player. I know you had mentioned him being potentially a top five player in this class. My question here is you've got Fashanu, like I said, the quality starting left tackle, but you have him, uh, you have a JPJ ranked over Fashanu. How much does positional value affect your grades, if at all? So positional value mostly effects with my grades quarterbacks i'll give quarterbacks a slight bump for positional value i don't really do it with other positions and we can get into how the bump i give quarterbacks here in a little bit because i you know you have your questions and uh, spo- behind the scenes look he has he has his questions in a google doc and everything like that and yeah uh, so i can see them Plan and, out the you show know, have a roadmap, guys. It's, it's called a rundown in the business <laughs> we have a rundown every now and again all right but we can get into the type of bump that I give quarterbacks here in a little bit. Other positions, not really. Um, and I do think that when we get to the actual draft, Fashanda will be drafted ahead of Jackson Powers mm-hmm. Johnson because 
of positional values. Talked about it with mm-hmm. Brock Bowers, even though he's rated top number five on my on on my top one hundred or as high as he is on my top one hundred. I know he's going to get drafted a little bit later than that. Jackson mm-hmm. Powers Johnson. I know he's going to get drafted a little bit later than this. Looking at the Steelers who just released their center today, um, that's a prime landing spot there. Mm-hmm. But part of why I like Jackson Powers Johnson over Fashanu, Fashanu to me is a left tackle only. Mm-hmm. Um, I have questions if he can really flip sides and last in the NFL. <clears throat> I also have questions if he's a true scheme diverse tackle option. Whereas Jackson Powers Johnson, any of the three interior spots, any scheme, it doesn't matter. He's got the he's got that extra versatility mm-hmm. that you just don't have with Fashanu, uh, which is why he is. You know, I believe he is a single spot. I believe they are eighth and ninth on my board on my top one hundred. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then you have Jaden Daniels as number ten overall. So that just goes to show you that uh, the positional value does necessarily matter in terms of where they're drafted, but where they're graded is uh, something completely different. So thank you for the insight to your process, uh, Stephen Eichenbaum. Jumping back in here with some more stars. I believe these are stars. Uh, yeah. Asking, oh, sorry, I just popped the the, the button again. Uh, can we get a quarterback next year? We got Jarrett Stidham. Yeah. The, the, I do think that the Broncos are going to go in and add a guy. Um, Sam Darnold seems to be the the hot button topic right now. I think that they're probably going to get a guy like Stidham, Jameis Winston, uh, maybe Gardner Minshew, if they can afford to do something like that. They're going to draft a guy this year, um, whether it's at 12 or trading back to get a guy like J.J. McCarthy, who we'll get here in in, in just a second. Uh, maybe a, a late day three guy, Talia Tagovailoa, who I know that it, you had mentioned it before, Davis Webb was very high on working with him at the Shrine Bowl a couple of weeks ago. So th- they're going to add another quarterback. It just may not be the one that you necessarily want them to go and get. They'll add quite two, honestly. I think. They'll add a free I, I, agent. I think so I think, as well. they'll, I think they'll add a rookie as well. Either yep. late in the draft, early in the draft, undrafted free agent. I think they'll mm-hmm. add to you, a free agent and then a rookie in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Back to your top 100 here. We got uh, picks 11 through 20. Uh, you have... Uh, Talise Fulaga, uh, Amarius Mims, and J.C. Latham all in this tier. These are all offensive tackles. Latham at the bottom, closer towards uh, the number 20 spot. How big is the gap between Fulaga, Mims, and Fashanu compared to Fashanu and Alt at the top of the class? And what I mean by that is saying you've got Alt, obviously, number two rated prospect in your class. You've got Fulaga at number nine, obviously, um, uh, or excuse me, uh, Fashanu at number nine, Fulaga at number 12, Mims 14, Latham 19. I'm not talking about the, the rankings on the big board. I'm talking about your tackle rankings. When you have Fashanu compared to Alt, how far is that gap between Fashanu and Fuaga? So for me, Joe Alt is the clear number one guy. Um, scheme versatile. I think he can flip and play either side, even though he's playing mostly left tackle, just watching how he use how his technique is. Um, so, so I think he's got that, got all the versatility and I think he's, you know, a day one high quality starter right away. Mm-hmm. Uh, now Fuaga, the battle for the number two spot, I think is between Fuaga and Fashanu and the combine will provide some cl- clarity there. I think that they are very close. Um, Mims could also be put into that conversation with his size and athleticism if he's testing um, and also getting some answers to some medical concerns that he has. But overall, Fuaga, who, as you said, is my 12th overall prospect, is actually closer to Fashanu than Mims is to Fuaga. So it would have to be a really good performance for Mims to get him into that conversation of being the number two spot. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense because um, a guy like Mims, he's so raw. The the athleticism is just incredible. This is a big dude that moves around, and he, he plays with – um, a lot of power. Uh, the athleticism again is just great, but the technique, the technical aspect of it, he's a raw player. Um, kind of like Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma, another just tremendous athlete for how big they are. Um, I, I want to call them similar players, but they're really not. But at the same time, you just there's a lot of the high end, the uh, the high end athleticism, the high ceiling with those two players. But the floor is so low. So I understand where you're where you're coming from with uh, with uh, um, the the conversation there of uh, Mims being or, or Fuaga being closer to Fashano than he is uh, close to Mims. Yeah. Um, Earlier today, uh, you recommended this. We got, a, we got a super chat here. David oh, Cromwell sorry. comes in with a $2 super chat saying, J.J. McCarthy isn't making it past Atlanta at eight. Um, he very well may not, 
but it is February 23rd. We still have the combine. We still have pro days. Mm -hmm. Maybe we shouldn't talk in such certainty now because this time last year, Will Levis wasn't making it past, what was it, eight overall? And he ended up going 33rd, I think, is where the talk was. And then a couple years ago, Malik Willis was 100% a uh, top 10 pick at this time of the year. A lot can change. A lot will change. Do I think McCarthy will make it past out of the top 12? No, I, I don't. Will I say with 100% and certain, certainty at this time that he won't? No, I won't because so much can change. There's a lot of different, a lot of things. Free agency hasn't even happened. Atlanta has been rumored to be big players for Justin Fields and Russell Wilson as a starting quarterback. So, and JJ McCarthy, yeah, he can still sit behind them, but will they want, will they want to use their first overall pick on that? So much can change between now and mm -hmm. then. We shouldn't talk in such certainty at this moment. Yeah, it, especially with Fields still being on the trade block, Russell Wilson still being a, a potential free agent. I mean, it's 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 so hard to like, again speak in certainties like that. It excuse me, I just I just burped. Um, no, it, I I can understand you know number um, at number eight for the. Uh, for the Falcons, but you, there's still so many options for them. They have capital, they have money, they they have the opportunity to trade up if they wanted to to go get a guy like Jaden Daniels. So uh, it, it, it there's still a long ways to go in this draft process. Uh, let's let's go back to uh, your your top 100 here. Uh, this is again picks 11 through 20, guys. I was listening to Dane Brugler earlier today. You were you actually recommended this podcast to listen to, to Dane and Nate Tice on the Athletic. And Dane Brugler has Terry and Arnold as his top cornerback in this class, which seems to be kind of the, like the majority of the consensus. Uh, there's been a lot of um, a lot of rumblings about the Broncos and mock drafts drafting Terry and Arnold, but you have Quinian Mitchell out of Toledo over him. What separates the two in your eyes? So for me, I think with Mitchell, you have a better technical foundation and a little bit more versatility and not necessarily positional versatility because Terry and Arnold can play anywhere in the secondary. I think Mitchell can as well. More mm -hmm. schematic versatility. I think Mitchell, you can play him in anything. Press man, off man, off zone, press zone, whatever you want, and have him be successful. Terry and Arnold, I think you're a little bit more limited for that, as well as the fact that Terry and Arnold, going back to that technical technical foundation that you get with Quentin Mitchell, not that Terry and Arnold's technique isn't bad, but he was a safety at to start with, and you can definitely still see some of mm -hmm. what he picked up as a safety still there as a corner. And when you mm -hmm. get to the NFL, if you're playing a boundary corner spot, you can't always play it, use the techniques that you learned as a safety. And he does. So being a safety has kind of hurt his development a bit as a boundary corner. That might take mm -hmm. a little bit more time. They're very close. The combine may even cause a flip here for me, depending on the testing for them. Um, so I, I just throw that out there. It's, these are two very closely graded corners for me. Right. So just quickly here, you, you have the, the positional versatility of Terry and Arnold and you have the scheme limited aspect, uh, at least on tape. Now, the senior bowl definitely provided a bunch of answers with Quinn and Mitchell, but he played off zone the majority of the time at Toledo. Mm -hmm. There's questions about his scheme versatility at the NFL level, man. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that you just throw on what he did at the senior bowl. Okay, I mean, his it's, press, it's he pressed enough. a lot at the time. He played, he was playing man in one on ones a lot, and the techniques were clean, they were mm -hmm. crisp. He showed that he can do it. Yeah. Um, well, you don't get to see it in game situation a whole lot. The fact that you can still show it and pick it up, something that you haven't done so well or done a whole lot of, and do as well as he did at the during the senior bowl week. Yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot of questions there. Right, and one of the, be the, the best reps for Quinian Mitchell, it was one of the first ones that we saw. Uh, I think it was day one going one-on-one -on -one against Roman Wilson, the wide receiver out of Michigan. Uh, Wilson runs a, an outside release double move. It was a, a stop and go route and Quinian Mitchell stayed in phase. He pressed him at the line of scrimmage, turned, turned his hips, stayed in phase, didn't get uh, beat by the double move and played through the route. I believe he actually picked that pass off. If I remember correctly, it was just, you can see the tools that are there and the the understanding of what he's supposed to be tasked with in coverage. I think that that's a big thing that I like about players that play in off zone because you don't get to see that particularly on tape, but you can definitely see that when they have the opportunity to. They understand what their assignment is and they stick with that assignment no matter what. They don't bite on fakes and stuff like that. I think Quinton Mitchell uh, really kind of displayed that at the, the Senior Bowl uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that's a, that's a good shout out 
out for you on that one. Let's move to 21 to 30. Uh, obviously, quarterback, uh, hot topic here. More. You have a question here that I want to get to about Barton. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I, sorry, I, 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 I misread my document here. Um, let, let, back to 11 to 20 here. Graham Barton, uh, the uh, offensive lineman from Duke. I have have not yet to see him play yet, but it sounds like he's a candidate to play at any of the five offensive line positions. Like most more than likely he's going to be guard. What's his best fit at the NFL level in your opinion? Yeah, I think that while he can play tackle at the NFL, I think that the measurements at the combine are going to basically erase all that. But he can play any of the three spots in on the interior offensive line. He can work in any scheme. I will be curious to see where he lands up at because his best spot is probably center. Um, mm -hmm. Dude is ridiculously smart. Such a high football IQ, putting him in that position at center to where he can make calls at the line and be that voice of communication, that leader on the offensive line. I think that's setting him up for his best chance of success. Yeah. Uh, inside outside versatility is definitely something I value in terms of watching offensive linemen and defensive linemen cornerbacks as well. But being able to play multiple positions is set, definitely something that I value very highly when I'm grading players. I can't wait to watch Barton. Um, it, I need to get into that here soon uh, because if if this is a guy that you have, I believe in your top, what, uh, what 19, I think is where he's at on your board. I, I don't have it pulled up right now, but regardless, uh, a high quality football player coming out of Duke. I can't wait to take another look at him here soon. Um, let's go to 21 to 30. And again, you know, the, the quarterback conversation, this is the one one player that has been mocked to the Broncos the most here recently at number 12, uh, JJ McCarthy. I have a second round grade on, on McCarthy right now. I think that there's still some issues with him throwing with uh, not necessarily timing, but ant uh, anticipation and throwing into the second window. Uh, you have a first round grade on him at the moment right now. What stands out to you to have him that high? So the, this gives me a chance to talk about positional value a bit. Um, to get to the number 24 overall on my top 100 board is from that positional boost. Without that, he is a, I think he's my second highest graded player in the second round. Um, and I only have 28 players, I think with first round grades at the moment. So he would still be a, you know, graded as a top 30 player just mm -hmm. there at, ba at base at 30, basically. Um, but the reason why he's so young and he's got mm -hmm. all the tools and traits that you want to work with. He's just like basically a giant ball of clay that you get a mold. Um, what I do don't it was it is frustrating to watch the Michigan offense and how when he would make a questionable decision or a questionable throw, they would go away from him. That yeah, happened yeah, yeah. Hot. Um, so it's kind of goes against this whole thing that of Harbaugh talking about how much they trusted him. Well, the tape says otherwise. But I still think it's a moment of you can learn. He can he goes through athletic, goes through reads quickly. All the tools and traits are there. It's just a matter of developing it. He's going to probably land somewhere that has a Kyle Shanahan style system or Mike Shanahan style system, that West Coast offense, you know, bootlegs and all that. And he can thrive in that mm -hmm. type of stuff. I, I, I love the fit with him um, because, again, we're talking a young player is not going to be 21 until I believe after the draft. He's only 21 or 20 years old right now. Um, no. And he's going to need a couple of years to sit and grow. Like he, he's got all the tools, all the he's, athleticism. He's 21. Oh. Or, he just turned 21 in January. Okay. So uh, apologies for that. Regardless, um, a, a young kid needs to learn and grow. Sean, dude, put him in, in Los Angeles behind Matt Stafford. Let Matt Stafford run out the rest of his career. Sean McVay, uh, that same Shanahan style bootlegs, the zone running stuff like that is, going to be a lot of fun to see him in in that particular offense. I think that that would be a great fit for him. Uh, Peter Middleton jumping in uh, from abroad. I'm not exactly sure where Peterson, uh, Peter is at here lately, but saying, hey, DVDD, looking forward to draft season. So are we. We are doing our best right now to dig through Eric Trickle's top 100 draft picks. And Peter, we know that you are one of the big supporters of the show. So thank you again for joining us here this evening. Singapore now, he says. He is in Singapore uh, for right now. Um, Let's see here. Let's go to number um, – let's do uh, – Let's go to uh, number 21 to 30 still here. Uh, this is kind of the sweet spot for interior defensive linemen. To start coming off the board, how far is the gap between Byron Murphy and Jerzon Newton and why? So there's a chance that Murphy is going to move up. I'm really curious about some athletic testing. I mean, I am expecting a pretty high 10-yard split from that 40 because the get-off is so quick um, from him. 
And that's one big change, big reason why he's so much higher than Newton. Another reason is I think there is a pretty sizable gap between them as run defenders. While Murphy has questions there, he he's I don't want to say he's not a liability and imply that Newton is a liability. I just think that he's a little bit more consistent with his run defense than Newton is, who is very much a guy of I'm going to shoot the gap and hope my gap sh- and hope that it that's correct with with uh, the ball carrier's choice to make a play against the run. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of vacating gaps, uh, a lot of issues there. But when he can shoot the right gap, I mean, he makes a huge play. It's just the consistency of it isn't there and not as much ability to hold up. Yeah. What are the, what about the size concerns with Jerzon Newton and Byron Murphy, quite honestly, because both of those guys have size concerns and their ability to hold up against the running game. I mean, that's always a concern, but there are the NFL, the way it is, the way it's going, there are, you can't get too caught up in the measurements with a lot of positions anymore because there are so many tricks of the trade that you can pick up to help mm-hmm. deal and handle with it. A lot of schematic changes, being a little bit more slanting base, a little bit more gap shooter, um, things like that can help you cover up these issues of a lack of size. And we've been seeing it more and more often in recent years. Um, and case in point, Kalijah Kansi had a great year this last year because yeah. Tampa Bay just used him correctly. So f- the right used him the what best way they could to cover up those size issues at Oliver with Buffalo. Well, he hasn't had the career that a lot of people expected. Aaron Donald wasn't, wasn't quite the seat. Wasn't quite the, uh, the size that you wanted, but has a lot of tricks, Aaron Donald. I mean, he, he's kind of the one who really kicked off this Renaissance, so to speak of these undersized interior defensive linemen. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense, especially as a, as a interior three tech defensive lineman, where you're playing in between guard and tackle, where you have that opportunity to get off the ball and go in multiple different directions there. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate you for bringing that into the, uh, into the conversation. We're going to rapid fire a bunch of stuff off here, guys. We only have a, a little bit of time left. So like I said, buckle your seatbelts. This is going to be crazy. Um, let's go 31 oh, to 40. Quick, 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 quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. You could rock. I'm not giving my top 100 picks for Denver. This is my top 100 board. Yes. Um, yep. Not necessarily who, not, not just specifically for Denver. You can go check out the article at milehuddle.com. I actually touched on that. If I was making this specifically for, um, for the Broncos, a lot of these players that I have on it wouldn't be on it just because team reasons or uh, character concerns or whatever just probably wouldn't be, wouldn't be on here for them. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so hard to do a, to do that without having some inside information. And fortunately for you, you do, you do have enough people you talk to, to get that information, but it, Doing a 100 specific players, uh, hell, I mean, most NFL teams only do 125 to 150 players that they're actually going to have on their draft board. We're we're talking. Eric and I do well. Eric specifically does 300 players. I did 200 last year, I, more than most NFL teams. So this is again, this is not for the Broncos overall in the NFL draft. It's a it's a great exercise. It's always, it's always fun to go into that. That said. This wide receiver class, dude, we haven't hardly spoken about them this year. Obviously, you've got Marvin Harrison Jr. at the top. You've got uh, Malik Neighbors, Rome, uh, Roma Dunze. you got Brian Thomas up there. you got a crazy guy at number five right now. Lad McConkey out of Georgia, uh, just outside of the first round, wide receiver five in your position rankings. What makes him so special to put him over guys like Keon Coleman, uh, Adonai Mitchell, and Malachi Corley? Um, so – wide receivers at any position really you have to balance you know the ceilings and the floors and all that stuff lad mcconkey is a very safe receiver um Mm -hmm. he's probably got one of the highest floors out of all the receivers in this class at the very least you are most likely i'd say it's 90 percent certain that he's going to be a very very good wide receiver three in the nfl and can Mm -hmm. absolutely do great things from the slot um, has some ability to work on the boundary, super reliable. And the biggest knock against him is the athleticism. I mm-hmm. think, I, well, I don't think he's going to be a great athlete. I think he's going to test better than expected based off of my calculations when I watch his tape and everything and my projections for it. Um, I think he just re- a reliable player with a high floor and still has some uh, plenty of room for a higher ceiling. Keon Coleman, Mitchell, Malachi Corley, they all have m- much lower floors. Mm-hmm. Um, Coleman and Mitchell, especially, I think they they're probably going to have a little bit of a tougher transition to the NFL. And Malachi Corley, I, I think, is very much role dependent. I love him. I think he's a a great prospect. His yak ability is absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. But you got to put him in a role that's going to be able to utilize that. 
Yeah. With, with McConkie, I guess the one thing that I have to say is that the size injury concerns are the, the things that I have in, in terms of negatives for him. But uh, the route running, the ability to just go and get the football, be reliable is is, is a tremendous player. Uh, interior offensive lineman, though, is one of the biggest things that you do in terms of the scouting process. You love your offensive lineman. And I know for a fact it's been a two year thing behind the scenes. Cooper Beebe. The uh, the I believe he's the right guard for the uh, Kansas State Wildcats. One of your dudes, dude, stand on the table. I want to hear you talk about him. Yeah, so he's going to be one that uh, those uh, measurement nerds like Nick Kendall. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> just a joke. Uh, Nick and I, we go back and forth about measurements and all that a lot. He's probably going to have a little bit shorter arms than you want. Um, yeah. I've seen some things about between 31 to 32 inches. Much for an interior guy. It's so shorter. Fine. I've seen shorter than um, 31 in places. But uh, with, with Cooper BB, again, we talked about, you know, tricks up their sleeve to de- handle size and stuff um, and length and stuff like that on the defense side of the ball. Offensive linemen have it too. Um, he's just so physical and he's got one of the best abilities to drop into his anchor and one of the strongest anchors in this class. Um, he knows he knows how to use his, use. He has those tricks already well developed to not have his length be such a negative impact to his blocking ability. Um, will it create? Will it be create some issues now and then? It will. Um, but he's so ridiculously strong and powerful. Mm-hmm. Like he's he's a guy that he's going to go in there every single snap. He's going to try try to take the defender's lunch money and then bully them a little bit around, toss them around, and then push get them on the ground. Like the yeah. attitude's there. He, he's smart. A lot of people think he can move inside at center as well and do quite well there. So he, that's an option. I don't think he's got great scheme versatility, um, but no, I, I I love this dude. I've uh, been a huge fan of him as a prospect for the last two years, as you kind of hinted at. Yeah, duo blocks are crazy with him. He's built like SpongeBob SquarePants, and I'm saying like he's a square at the top side with legs straight down and just packed full of power. He's so much fun to watch, man. Uh, let's go to 41 through 50. Uh, the Broncos obviously have a massive hole opening up at the linebacker position. Josie Jewell is potentially going – is a free agent this year. Um, I don't know if they're going to move on from Alex Singleton, but they have to get a linebacker to come in and fill in as a reliable starter because Drew Sanders hasn't really shown the growth yet. He's still young, long ways to go in his career for sure. But Junior Colson is the first linebacker on your board out of Michigan at 44 overall. And it shows kind of how bad this class is to begin with. Is there a guy in this class somewhere in this range, you know, 44 to 55 to 60, somewhere around in there that can get the job done as a starter? Yeah, I mean, I think there's three guys at the linebacker position that can be starters right away. That's Colson, Edron Cooper, who has 52nd overall, and Peyton Wilson, who's 74th overall. But he has severe medical issues. Um, with him, medical red flags. And so, yeah, any of those three, I think, could be day one starters at the linebacker position. There's a couple other guys that aren't in my top 100 that can potentially develop into them. Um, but one thing with these guys and what you look for is you're looking for height and length in linebackers nowadays to mm-hmm. shrink those, you know, those overthrow uh, throwing windows um, where you're trying to drop it, you know, under the safeties above the linebackers. It's part of the reason why N'Kobe Dean fell so far last year. He just with yeah. short with mm-hmm. short arms. Um, so you're looking for that. And these three guys have that. They're all quality players that are very well rounded. Um, and then Drew Sanders a little bit, just touch on that is a lot of people forget that last year was his second year working as an off ball linebacker. Um, he was an edge rusher for his whole collegiate career to his final yep. year. Yep. And even then it, what he was asked to do as a linebacker was not yep. as much as you typically see at the collegiate level, let alone the NFL level. Mm-hmm. So, it's still, it's going to take some time for him to grow and develop as a linebacker. Um, and the Broncos may even be considering him keeping an edge, which I think would be a massive mistake. I, I do um, too. But we'll see. We'll see how much he can grow this year and what they do with him. But yeah, there's definitely these three guys, these three Colson, Cooper, and Wilson are three guys who could be starters right away. Yeah, uh, David Young can jump in here with a perfect question to tie in here for the next one that I have. Uh, $2 super chat. Who would you pair with Pat Sertan, the second at the cornerback position? Now, Eric, there's a guy that is like all over the board in terms of his draft grade right now. Missouri cornerback Ennis Raystra. Like, I've seen him be a top 15 player, according to Matt Miller. Uh, da- uh, Daniel Jamara had him as number 24 on his big board early in January. 
you have him at 49. Dane Brugler has him at 48 in his top 100. And there's another play. I think his Bleacher Report had him as the 93rd overall player. We're talking 80 picks essentially apart in terms of the range on this guy. What makes him so hard to nail down in terms of his draft stock? So Ennis Reichstraw out of Missouri, he's a guy who really came on this last year. Um, he's He's got some good twitch. I'm very curious about his measurements. He seems not super long, but very lanky. Um, mm. I think he's a, a twitched up player. He's got some good twitch to him, some good movement skills. But I think the overall athletic testing is going to be a little bit disappointing um, for him. I'm not sure he's a complete athlete that you typically look for um, from your corners. And on that note, there's another corner here that could, depending on the athletic testing, could jump over Rake Strong. That's TJ Tampa out of Iowa State. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Dude, a freaky athletic. Ball skills, though, are the big question with him. IQ is a big question with him, too. That's another one of those players that played a lot of off zone from what I remember of him at Iowa State. Um, would you pair uh, either one of those guys, TJ Tampa or Ennis Rakestraw, with uh, Pat Sertan? No. <laughs> so, TJ, TJ, TJ Tampa, he's probably going to test freaky. Still has a lot to learn to be a corner. Um, Rake Straw, I don't think he's a great fit. I think he might be better as a nickel and as well, which is part of the reason why he's okay. a little bit lower for me and has a chance to fall down some more. Um, but I'm trying to think of a guy that, you know, outside of Quinny Mitchell or Terry, Terry Arnold, who might be a great fit for them. Um, I got one. I, 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 I got one that would, that would be, I, I have a question lined but, up for this specific player here in just a minute. It also, it also depends on what they're going to do with their coverage scheme. Because if mm-hmm. they are going to do a little bit more press, man, you and I are on the same wavelength here with the same player. But if they yep. continue to be a little bit more off because they can't get after the quarterback, so they have to blitz more, so they have to do more zone, which Paxton Tan struggles with, then the guy that you and I that you're thinking of is 100 percent not the guy you want there. And we'll get to him here in a little bit. But let's rapid okay. fire the rest of these questions, get through them um, real quick. We only got about eh, ten or more so questions, which we can rapid fire yeah, and get through them here in the next ten minutes. Yep. So the, the big one here, uh, we're going 51 to 60 on your big board. Uh, Kyron Omegaji, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Offensive tackle out of Yale. Uh, you've been like behind the scenes praising him a lot. Uh, super toolsy player, massive upside. But again, he played at Yale. This is an Ivy League school, major talent discrepancy between Ivy League and the NFL. How much does stuff like that affect his stock? Obviously, lower level is a big thing. But what do you think of, of, of him being able to project to the NFL level? So there are two things with him, two big things with him. Very toolsy, has everything that you want to work with, still has to v- develop a lot as a tackle, although he's got a really good foundation, which is one thing that we've been seeing a lot more with these smaller school tackles or offensive linemen. They've been having coming into the NFL draft with really good foundations from the tech, from the technical standpoint. But when you're looking at smaller school guys, do they dominate their opponents week in, week out? He does. There, there's no question about it. He was completely just pure domination and on the field. So that box is checked. It's still going to affect his stock because it's still a significant jump, but adding to it, he got hurt. He didn't play a whole lot this last year, if I remember correctly, or um, got hurt late in the season. I can't remember exactly which, um, but he missed some time with an injury. And so that's something that's also going to be cleared up at the combine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And those, those raw toolsy players that come from small schools, man, they're, they're, they're a lot of fun to watch, man. Um, let's go to the edge defender position here because you have a couple of players, one uh, in Dallas Turner, who I believe is your top edge and another player you have with another first round grade in chop Robinson out of Alabama and Penn state respectively, but they have a couple of teammates with them that are inside of your top 60, Chris Braswell out of Alabama and Adisa Isaac out of Penn state, both of whom played pretty well at, at mobile in the senior bowl a couple of weeks ago, especially in practices. I've heard some rumblings though, that, uh, Braswell potentially could be a first round pick. Adisa Isaac might be edge five in this, and they could potentially be better than their counterparts at the NFL level. How much upside do these guys have? And is there a possibility they could become better than the two guys that were drafted ahead of them on their own respective teams? I don't see it of them ended up being better, but it can always happen. Um, So much that we can't see Uh, a lot of the draft is a crap shoot. And I think a lot of people forget, uh, forget that. So I don't see either of them ending up better than that. 
Adisa Isaac still has so much to learn as an edge rusher. He's still kind of on the newer side of football, and it shows a lot. the The raw ability is there, and we got to. That's why he did well at Mobile. But when, um, but when things kind of got a little uh, tough for him, he didn't have the technique to sit there and you know get off blocks or anything. And that's a big issue with him. As for Chris Braswell, he's going to need a system. Um, to that will really help cover up his deficiencies. He is very Nick Benito esque. Uh, he's mm-hmm. not doesn't offer much as a run defender. Um, can do all right in coverage. A uh, quick get off, um, athletic pass rusher that's very undersized and is essentially a liability on rundowns. So you got to try to figure out how to work that in. Maybe moving him and playing him in a kind of a hybrid off ball and on rundowns, edge on passing down kind of. Uh, kind of move for him kind of position for him. Yeah. Yeah. We got Michael Ronquillo jumping in here with some stars really fast. Got to grab this from our great friend over there on Facebook. Great show tonight. Lance and Eric on the Dev Valley deep divers go Broncos. Now let's move to number 61 through 70 here on your big board. The first thing that pops off on your article is that you have Spencer Rattler, the quarterback from South Carolina, formerly of Oklahoma off the board over Michael Penix jr. Both obviously very, very talented. Uh, both also have major red flags for various reasons. I mean, injury concerns for Penix, uh, attitude issues with Spencer Rattler. How much do those uh, issues affect, affect their stock? And what makes you like Rattler more right now? So remember that there is a bump as well. Uh, quarterback bump, do get that positional value bump. And Rattler is, you know, higher than Michael Penix uh, for me. I think when you actually watch them, obviously medicals and character, medicals for Penix, character for Rattler, those are the two question marks that are going to be at the combine, which kind of takes off the non-field stuff for both of them out of the equation for here, for their for their placement here. On the field, when you watch Rattler, I think over the last two years at South Carolina, he had the same five offensive linemen start a game like a total of three times. Um, and he elevated that offense. Mm-hmm. I there when you watch that offense, there is no question that he made them a better around him. He can he has got enough athleticism to move around. He's not a statue in the pocket. Mm-hmm. Uh can make any of the throws that you want, works the middle of the field, works the outside, works every level of the field with plenty of arm strength and arm talent. Um Penix, on the other hand, there's times where it looks like that the talent around him is elevating him. Um right. there are severe questions about him working the intermediate middle of the field areas you know that 10 plus yardage situation to you know 10 plus 10 to like 20 25 yards downfield middle of the field is not good at all um he's very statuesque in the pocket um and then of course the medicals he's a little bit older all those um Penix is a guy that i think you're going to continue hearing him drop a little bit i think it was daniel jeremiah in his podcast with Bucky Brooks mentioned the fact that, or it might have been Dane Brugler and Nate Tice. One of them mentioned Michael Penix somewhere not being a top 100 pick. I think that that was Jeremiah, quite honestly. I, I think, because I, I remember hearing that and I was like, wow, that's crazy. I mean, we were talking about him as the number two. A potential option at number twelve overall. I'm still comfortable with that if they if they want to go that direction, pending the medical checks and whatnot. Regardless, so you mentioned something about the talent surrounding the players uh, in Spencer Rattler and with Michael Penix Jr. You have Jalen McMillan as their third wide receiver from Washington off the board here. LSU had two players in the top twenty in uh, Malik Neighbors and uh, Brian Thomas Jr. When evaluating that quarterback talent, how much do you have to take that weaponry and overall roster construction into the consideration there? Because, like you said, Spencer Rattler, what, uh, I think 12, 10 out of the 12 games he played this year had five different starting offensive linemen in front of him. So it's always a factor. Um That's always the thing in the NFL. How much is the talent around the quarterback elevating them? How much is the quarterback elevating the talent around them? Um Mm -hmm. Goes both ways, and we've seen it work both ways to different levels of success. Um, obviously, you know, Patrick Mahomes just elevates everybody to another level. Peyton Manning did that, Tom Brady did that, and then we see these quarterbacks who are elevated by others, they tend to fall short. Um, so it's always a factor, but it is something that is always hard to pin down, and it is something that is very subjective when you watch over their tape. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
71 through 80 in this stretch, you have a couple of guys with some inside and outside versatility on the defensive line and, and Braden Fisk and Brandon Dorless uh, out of Florida State and Oregon, respectively. I'm a huge fan of Dorless. I brought him up a couple of weeks ago with his ability as a pass rusher, specifically from a three technique. I haven't focused on Fisk enough yet. I haven't really watched his tape. What puts Fisk higher on your board right now? I would not be surprised if after the combine, uh, we're talking about Fisk a lot more. It would not surprise me if Fisk has one of the fastest 10 yard splits out of, you know, defensive linemen and edge rushers combined. So quick off the snap, just immediate burst, so quick to shoot gaps. The what the whole story at the senior bowl with the fact that the day of the game, because one team did not have enough defensive linemen, they would have only had three defensive linemen. He was asked to switch teams and he had an outstanding performance, just completely almost essentially dominated the game, so to speak. Um, so he's a guy that very likely going to move up a little bit on my board as well from here. As for Brandon Dorless, um, he's a little bit more labored of a mover. He's tall, mm -hmm. he's lanky, and I wish he was a little bit more fluid, and he's just not. He's a tweener who just doesn't have a, a position where he's very clearly better. Now, Darius Robinson, I think, is a good example of what I'm what kind of what I'm getting at here. Darius Robinson mm -hmm. still kind of has that is kind of a bit of a tweener can rush right. from the outside can rush from inside. But when you watch his tape, he is significantly better working off the edge doorless. You don't see it. You don't see him working better off the edge. You don't see him working better inside. So it, he has severe issues that kind of hinder his ability to affect the game at bolt from either spot. And not so much the case with like Fisk, who doesn't have that, you know, stand up edge outside ability, but you can line up from a, a three technique, even a zero technique. If you're in obvious passing situations, if he's just going to shoot a gap, um, he can line up as a zero technique. He can line up all the way out to a, a five technique. Um, so he still has that versatility to move around the defensive line, just not work as an edge rusher like Doralis does. Right. Yeah. And and that makes a lot of sense. I, I, I'm still a huge fan of doorless, man. I, the inside outside versatility really just pops with me, but here in that 71 to 80 run is where you start the, the running back run. It, it, you have a handful of players all tightly ranked together, starting with uh, Jalen Wright. Uh, I believe he was 78 on, on your big board, but Blake Corum, a guy that's one of was widely considered one of the best running backs in the, in college football this, this year uh, falls in line running back three in your rankings, talented as a runner, a little bit smaller, good receiver out of the, uh, out of the backfield. What are the bigger concerns with this play that has him this far down the board? So one thing is this running back class isn't good. There's no talent right. at the top. And these are guys where, even if they, even if you throw in a, like running backs at the top, they're still going to be here. Th th these grades are where they're graded. Um, no positional value, nothing like that. Now, why is Blake Quorum running back three? I'm a mileage guy. I've talked about. I'll talk about it all the time with mm -hmm. running backs. Yep. Yep. How many total touches do they have? How many total touches are they entering the NFL? He's got a lot. There's a limit, and NFL teams have a limit. And while Quorum mm -hmm. isn't over that limit, he's pretty close to it. Um, so it wouldn't surprise, I would expect him to go around three. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if he fell a little bit because of that, you know, that mileage limit that teams have. Right. Yeah. And I think that you, you would said it's like a thousand total touches, uh, at, at the, uh, at the college level. It was something we talked about with Philip Lindsay for the longest time here in Broncos country. But speaking of a, a, like a guy like Philip Lindsay, change of pace back, juiced up electric runner. You've got Bucky Irving out of Oregon, number 81 overall on your board, change of pace back a guy that does really well out of the backfield. Would he be an upgrade over Jaleel McLaughlin? If the Broncos were looking for a player like him, um, in, in the third round. Yes, and Bronco fans aren't gonna are, aren't gonna like this. Jill McLaughlin, fine player, mm -hmm. but just because he was an undrafted free agent, he is getting a bit of uh, you know right. extreme yeah. overhype as a result of that. He, he's a fine player, and he can be still can be even better, but like he, he's not the greatest thing since sliced bread. Now, Bucking mm -hmm. Irving, Bucky Irving, I'm going to be curious what his full forty time is because he seems quicker than fast. Whenever I watch him, he always I always seem to question is like, does he have that one extra gear to be a true home run hitter consistently? Right. Yeah. I don't see it a lot on tape. So I'm curious to be curious to see what his 40 time will be. 
it, it, it reminds me a lot of uh, of Philip Lindsay, where you thought that he had that extra gear and he just didn't have it more often than not. Uh, 81 through 90, again, here we have a wide receiver jumping in here out of South Carolina. Xavier Leggett seemingly tumbled down draft boards lately. There was hype of him being as high as wide receiver four, wide receiver five, potentially a first-round pick this year. What's the story with him and why has he fallen this far? So the more you watch of Leggett, the more one-dimensional he seems. Um, his route running is a complete mess. He doesn't have understand nuance whatsoever. He can stack a defender and you know run a nine route, mm -hmm. but he doesn't have great speed for a nine route. Mm -hmm. um, he, he's a contested catch guy, which is fine. But the thing is, is he was getting hyped up at, at the start of the season at being at like 6'4", 215 pounds, 220 yeah, pounds. He's, six, one, he's, two, like, he's like barely over six foot. Yeah, six one two oh five, I think, is what he measured in at this season, and barely game. over two hundred pounds. Yeah, like so, just one dimensional, not having the size that's dropping him a little bit. I still think he can be a, a a quality receiver, but I just think it's going to be a little bit more work to get him there. Yeah, it, when you expect him to be six three two twenty five, that's a, a, a definitely a, a big boost in his in his uh, in his stock. Six one two oh five, I believe, is the senior bowl measurements. That's that hurts him a lot. Uh, Ninety one through one hundred. Last couple of questions I have before we have to get out of here. Rapid fire these off. You say specifically in your piece on milehighhuddle.com. Again, guys, go check out Eric Trickles' top one hundred big board. You say in that piece, if not for his broken leg suffered late in the season, Zach Zinter, interior offensive lineman from Michigan, would be a lot higher in the top 100 how high could he potentially be i like this player a lot man so it's impossible to say just how high he could have gone when you miss the playoff run missing the you know the texas mm -hmm. game and the washington yeah. game yeah. it definitely it could have helped him a lot it could have boosted him into being in that first round conversation yeah it could have exactly. meant him squarely in the second round so i can't say for sure exactly how high he would be if not for the broken leg but i can say that I think it's safe to say that he would have been higher than 92 overall on my board. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I, I think if I go back and watch him again, I'll have to refinalize my grade. I have him as a top 50 player in this class. Uh, last question here. We alluded to it a little bit ago talking about cornerbacks. Uh, Jarvis Brownlee Jr., dude, the player that I wanted to bring up to you as I was watching the mock draft you did last week. I wanted to, like, screaming at my phone. Dude, Jarvis Brownlee Jr. is available. Let's talk about him, man. Press coverage cornerback. He played very well at the senior pool. Is there starting cornerback upside on his tape? And could he potentially play uh, uh, on the opposite side of pass or tan? If they're going to be more press man, yeah. Yeah. If they're not going to be more press man, no. Um, Jarvis Brownlee is, to me, an extremely di one-dimensional corner. He's either in a press man uh, scheme or he's a liability. If he doesn't get mm -hmm. his hands on off this uh, at the line of scrimmage, he just he doesn't know how to he doesn't know how to recover. It's like he doesn't know what to do with himself almost. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it, he could, he would be a great choice to try and pair up pair opposite or pair with Patrick Stan opposite him um, if they're going to be more press man. But you know the Broncos they wanted to be a little bit more press man this year, but they couldn't do it. They had to run more zone because they couldn't get after the quarterback. Um, mm -hmm. So do they take that risk or do they try to find somebody a little bit more versatile or a little bit more zone heavy guy uh, to kind of cover for that? Hard, mm -hmm. hard to say, um, but definitely have some options for it. Yeah, man. Well, first things first, now that we're done rapid firing all these questions, I want to say first off, congratulations. And thank you for the tremendous work you always do for us here at milehighhuddle.com. It's, it's always a blast to be able to talk football with you and, and just explore the draft. We apologize for getting a little long-winded there at the beginning of the show. But, man, fun show. Thank you again for everything you do. Any last words before I kick us out of here? Yeah, because we got to get going. Combine. We're going to be talking about the Combine next week. It's getting yep. underway. Yep. Um, so I am super excited for that. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next week. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's it's always fun, like I said, to talk football with you. The Combine is one of my most favorite events of the year. Uh throughout the draft season. So thank you all for joining us here on the Dove Valley Deep Divers podcast. You all stay safe, take care, have a great rest of your weekend. And as always, go Broncos. We will see you guys same time, same place.